Good morning again and uh, welcome. Today we are uh, right smack in the middle of basically uh, this uh, section on chemistry. So uh, we're going to finish that and hopefully have our exam. Uh, I'm hoping now to uh, change it to actually uh, Tuesday instead because I looked at the calendar and we probably have to, uh, we're at least uh, one, uh, we're half a week behind in terms of the schedule. So we'll probably have to change the exam to Tuesday, um, uh, May 11th, instead of, uh, I think originally I was thinking to change it to the 13th, okay? And that way the 13th will be a regular class. So we'll see, okay? We'll see. So let me share with you the screen. It depends, of course, we have to finish this uh, two chapters first, 17, 18, and 19, three of them actually. One of them is today. So let me... Uh, share the screen move this closer in here again uh, today is how uh, we're going to talk about chemical reactions basically and what impacts the, the chemical reaction and uh, how is it uh, classified basically you have reactants and you have uh, res uh, resultants and then uh, or products and then um, the bottom line is that uh, the re chemical reaction can be influenced by several factors, including basically the uh, uh, temperature, including uh, catalysts, including things like that to uh, expedite the uh, reaction or slow it down, depending on what you want. And uh, or chemical reaction can uh, and come in two different uh, shapes, basically when it comes to energy, either uh, the ones that require energy to uh, for them to happen, and those are endothermic uh, chemical reactions. And there are chemical reactions that actually uh, result in energy, give you energy, excess energy. Those are uh, exothermic, uh, basically, uh, chemical reactions. Uh, at the bottom in there, it, see, it says that chemical reactions are driven by entropy. Actually, as a matter of fact, anything in the universe is actually uh, governed by the entropy. And the entropy is a law that tells you that a system basically wants to achieve a uh, higher state of entropy or uh, disorder, if you want to call it that way, too. And the chemical reaction, if you want to see it, if it's feasible or not, usually what you do, you calculate this quantity before and after. And if it does not increase, the chemical reaction is not possible. So what you do in this case, you uh, you enhance your chances by adding something like a catalyst or changing the temperature or making something for it to happen so that it can result that, uh, so that that re chemical reaction can happen. So this is a little bit of a requirement and that's coming from thermodynamics because heat exchange is always associated with chemical reactions. A chemical reaction re uh, requires some conservative uh, quantities. One of them is a conservation of mass and the other one is a conservation of energy. If you tally all the energy before and all the energy after, it should be the same, okay? At least in an ideal situation. So there are losses actually, but that's basically in a, in, a, in a nutshell what it is. So if you count for the losses, then actually there is a perfect conservation of energy. Also conservation of mass in terms of uh, the classical sense, of course, and that is uh, uh, if you count, for example, the number of uh, atoms that constitutes the uh, reactants, you should be able to find the same number at the end when the chemical reaction is, uh, is over and the resultants and the results, okay? Or the products. The thing with it is this leads to something very important that chemists deal with in chemical uh, equation, and that is balancing the equation. So every equation has to be balanced because you cannot end up with more uh, products than when you started with because of conservation of mass only, okay? And that is really the essence of the, how chemical reactions happen. Down the road in the next few chapters, we're gonna classify the chemical reactions according to what happened to the, to the reactants, okay? So again, uh, a chemical reaction is just a rearrangement, basically, of the individual atoms. For example, we start with, in this case, four hydrogen atoms, and we start with two oxygen atoms, albeit these four are actually combined in two different molecules. Each one of them is a hydrogen molecule, and this is actually a, an oxygen molecule. When you combine both of them, then you end up with the same number, basically, of what you started with, except that their arrangement is slightly different, okay? 
uh, in a sense that the oxygen which was bound to another oxygen now is no longer doing that, but rather it's bound to two hydrogen atoms. And this is the water molecule, basically. So this is what the chemical reaction in a nutshell is. So I mentioned uh, that uh, the law of mass conservation, no atoms are gained or lost during any reaction. So this is a law, okay? And because uh, you have to, this is one of the basic fundamental laws in nature, okay? So uh, which means that the number of times atoms appear before the reaction must be the, number, the same number after. So in this case, for example, we start with six and we end up with six. Albeit, albeit the arrangement was uh, three in a, in a molecule, now it's actually two in a molecule. Instead of having, we started with two molecules, now we have actually three molecules, okay? So that is the, 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 uh, what's going on in this chemical reaction. So all of these examples deals with this thing in here. It's actually the same example. And how at some point, basically, there is a clear separation between the reactants and how they gather together to form the new molecules. Uh, three of them. Same thing in here. If uh, you color code them and you ask yourself, is this chemical reaction is balanced? The only way you know is actually track down each and every one of those individual uh, uh, atoms, basically. And since they're color coded in here, I have this green, there are two of them. I still have two of them at the end. So as far as the greens are is concerned, it's balanced, but that's not enough. You have to have each and every one of them. So the oranges, you have one and two, and you have at the end, or am I looking at different colors in here? How about, are this orange or blue? It looks like to me orange, but I think it's probably blue. Anyway, if you count the number of atoms in here, for example, this one's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You have four in here and four that's eight and uh, four that's 12 and two that's 14. I guess this, and this is something that we uh, humans have an issue with in terms of colors. You sometimes have a problem distinguishing different colors. So if this are the same, then this is one, two, three, four, and I have one, two, three, four. If that's the case, then we have a balance. Otherwise it's not, okay? So this is the same basically reactants rearranging themselves into, so this is the same process. In other words, the bottom line is whatever you start with. Oh, the question was how many diatomic uh, molecules are present? Okay, there are two of them in here and in here you have one of them. So in the re reactants, there are two of them and the, uh, in the re products, there is only one of them. Okay. So anyway, is this chemical reaction balanced? You have to count each and every one of those elements in it. Carbon, I have one carbon and I have one carbon here. So as far as carbon is concerned, this is balanced. Hydrogen, I have four of them and I have two times two in here, which is four. So this is balanced. Oxygen, I have two times two, which is four. And I have two times one, which is two in here, but I have one times two also. So a total of four, two plus two is four. So this is chemical reaction is balanced. When you look at each and every one of the individual uh, constituents. So uh, to express it mathematically, you really have to go to the periodic table and check really them, the, the atomic mass unit that is you associated with each and every one of them. Typically, the number is not an exact integer. And why it's not an exact integer? It's because of the isotopes. Oxygen is not exactly one isotope. That's why the number is not exactly 16. But uh, a given atom by itself has 16 nucleons in, inside of it, it has 16 basically uh, some of uh, protons and neutrons inside of it. And each and every one of them basically is a, uh, is, uh, has a, a one atomic unit mass whether proton or neutron. So that is a total of 16. So in the case of this molecule in here made up of this two uh, oxygen atoms, so you have a 32 AMU atomic mass unit, okay? Whereas carbon, which is again, for the same reason that I mentioned before for the oxygen, it's not made up of the single same uh, isotope. So in this case, you have uh, 12 AMUs. So on the atomic level, this is what happened in here. You have one carbon, 
an in individual atom, very tiny, which ma whose mass is about 10 to the negative 20, uh, 26 kilograms. And this one is roughly the same order of magnitude, albeit slightly more because of the fact that you have 32 AMUs versus uh, 12. Uh, then the two will combine and give you basically CO2, carbon di uh, dioxide. You have two of the oxygens in here. One of them is gas in the gas phase, and the other one is actually in the in the uh, in the uh, solid phase. But what if you would want to have three grams of this one? So you really don't want twelve grams. You have only three grams. Three grams is the one fourth, or I'm sorry, one uh, yeah, one fourth of twelve. So technically, you should really bring also one fourth of thirty two. 32 divided by four, uh, by, uh, by four should be eight grams. So now when you combine the eight grams with the three grams, now you will have a perfect CO2 combination, basically carbon dioxide in here. During any more of this, they don't have enough carbon dioxide to mix with this one, uh, carbon to mix with it to form carbon dioxide. So we'll have an excess of uh, oxygen, basically molecule, molecule sitting by themselves. To bring any more of carbon, uh, carbon by itself, carbon atoms, and you only brought eight grams of this, so if you brought four grams of uh, the carbon in this case, again, you will have one gram that is not going to combine with any oxygen in here to form carbon dioxide. So this is what it meant balancing an equation. If I'm going to have CO2 made out of carbon and uh, oxygen, I have to have these quantities basically in this, in this ratios. Obviously, in the lab, I may need to have a different number other than this three grams, for example. That's, for example, I, all I have is 2.1732 grams. So in this case, how much uh, oxygen would I need? I have to do the ratio of 12 divided by the number that I mentioned, 2.17. Then I will find exactly how much is needed in here. Anything more than that is in excess. It's not needed. So that's why we, what we mean by balance of an equation in the sense that we know internally what's going on. We know internally that a given carbon molecule by itself, a carbon atom by itself, I'm sorry, needs two oxygen atoms to combine with it. And a carbon atom by itself has 12 nucleons, okay? This is the, the typical, uh, basically, uh, the main isotope of carbon, 12 nucleons, okay, carbon 12. And that is six protons and six neutrons. Uh, oxygen atom, because I need two of them, the main basically uh, uh, isotope of oxygen has eight protons and eight neutrons for a total of 16 nucleons per atom times two, that is 32. So if I know this is exactly what's going on internally, then the actual lab in here and how many quantities can, can I need depends on these ratios, okay? So again, instead of dealing with this, numbers in here, nucleons and this numbers in here, we use the Avogadro number. So what an Avogadro number is, it's actually this number in grams. Remember the, what I mentioned is the mass of a given nucleon is of the 10 to the negative 26, or depending. I mean, for the case of hydrogen, it's exactly 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. But of course, the more nucleons I add, the larger the number becomes. So 10 to the negative 26 is a typical number. Uh, but then if I bring that many grams of the atom, by definition, this is Avogadro's number. It's this many atoms I brought in. So instead of talking about grams and basically using the units for mass, and probably I have different units for probably some other units, then it's convenient actually to use the mole instead, not this one. Okay. Uh, the mole by definition, one mole contains this many grams, which is the AMU grams. So if the number is 12 for the atomic mass unit for carbon. That means I'd bring 12, carbon, 12 grams of carbon. 12 grams of carbon have this many uh, atoms in it. Again, one, a, uh, one mole of oxygen molecule has 32 grams, but an oxygen atom itself, one mole of it, has exactly 16 grams. If I, if I, if I make that distinction between a molecule and, and an element itself and use the, 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 uh, the uh, 
this number in here for the moles, then I'm in perfect shape. So if I look the uh, the the atomic mass unit for the uh, for the uh, helium, and it says 4.003, then in this case I'm accounting actually for all the different isotopes, which is basically helium three is the main isotope for uh, main other isotope. The main isotope is helium four actually, but the small quantities of helium three. So that's why the number is actually slightly different than this one. Okay. Uh, than four, okay? So in this case, I know exactly I have this many atoms of, of, of helium. And again, helium is actually a, an inert gas. So that's exactly the number of atoms. Same thing, sodium, it's not exactly 23, but it's 22.990 because of the uh, different. So if I bring a mole of uh, sodium, this is how much it's going to look like. This one is a solid. This one is some sort of a, what is it? Uh, also solid, this is lead, okay? And this is uh, gas. So instead of dealing with the mass and trying to see how many quantities and all of that, the chemical equation actually represents the number of moles. So two moles of hydrogen molecules. And each molecule has two hydrogen atoms actually. So basically, this is how many moles we're going to need for this chemical reaction. Add it to one mole of oxygen. One mole of oxygen molecule, uh, basically, is 32 grams because each oxygen molecule is made up of two oxygen atoms. So now, two, which is the number is 6.02 times two, so it's 12.04. And you add it to this number of atoms, or the, uh, this number of molecules for uh, the oxygen uh, molecule, then when you combine them, this is how many moles of, two moles basically of water, which is this many molecules of H2O. So this is basically how the equations are balanced. Four grams plus 32 grams is 60, 36 grams because also if you want to use it in terms of grams. So all of this details, how many moles in 45.5 grams of chlorine? I need to know the mass of the chlorine in here in order for me to, uh, to find this number, okay? So chlorine is a diatomic gas, so it's Cl2, so I need two of them. And uh, So if I look at the periodic table, what is the periodic table in here? Do we have it in here? So I'm going to whatever I have in the, uh, it says 35.453, okay? I have to multiply that number by two, okay? 35 times two is 70. 0.453 when you multiply it by two is basically 0.96, okay? 0.906, okay? So it's roughly 71, okay? That's why we have 71. So 45.5 divided by 71 is 0.64. So it's slightly more than half it's almost two thirds of a uh, of a uh, of a mole, so that is how the calculations are conducted. So you have to refer back to the periodic table, and this is because chlorine has a lot of isotopes. That's why this number is not exactly thirty five or thirty six. Okay, it's not an integer. So how many grams of water are produced from one point two five moles of methane? So one mole of methane will give you two moles of water. But now you don't bring 1.25, you bring, you, bring, you, bring, you bring more than one, actually it's 1.25. So it's gonna be slightly more than two grams. So the correct answer should be, it's not gonna be 11 for sure. 45 is too many. 90 is way too many, remember, I'm sorry. 45, we need two moles, slightly more than two moles. One mole is actually 18. 
So we need slightly more than 36. So the correct answer cannot be 22. The correct, it has to be more than 36. It's, it's 90 is too much. So the correct answer is around 45, which is the correct answer, okay? So these are some of the examples that you might be uh, asked during the questions. So please review these questions and uh, you should be able to, uh, if you have any difficulty, please let me know, okay? So the reaction rate, the speed with which reaction uh, products form from the reactants, that's basically what the reaction speed is. It can be helped by the concentration or the temperature of the cal catalyst, as I mentioned in the intro. So basically, in order for the chemical reaction to happen, you really have to be in contact. The two uh, uh, basically reactants have to uh, contact with one another. So one way of doing it is by increasing the concentration. The more you have per unit volume, the, 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 the more basically chances that you will have reactions. So the more you have, the more there is chance for them to collide, which means the more chance for them to react. And here we're uh, uh, combining nitrogen and oxygen to form NO, okay? Carbon, I mean, nitrogen monoxide. Temperature also will increase the, uh, the chances of reaction because then they will be moving faster, although they may be of less concentration, but there is a chance, more chance for them to react once they touch one another. And the catalyst will basically, uh, first of all, there is an activation energy that, the, that, that is required for, uh, for any two reactants to reach basically the other level, to reach basically the, uh, to produce the products in this case, okay? So this activation energy can be lowered in the presence of a, uh, the presence of a catalyst. So the gap basically that you have to overcome in terms of energy could be lowered into using a catalyst and catalyst is, is a, a middle basically, uh, 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 some, uh, it's a middle actually uh, a reactant that is going to help expedite the, rea the chemical reaction, okay? So uh, ozone, for example, can be broken down into a regular oxygen using as a catalyst uh, uh, chlorine. And that's why chlorine is dev devastating to actually the upper uh, ozone layers because of this chemical reaction. It makes the breaking of the ozone layer much easier. And the ozone, ozone layer basically is broken because now it becomes regular oxygen. And regular oxygen does not absorb as much as uh, as, uh, does not absorb uh, the ultraviolet radiation that comes from the sun. So this chemical reaction is really not a desirable chemical reaction at all. It's actually undesirable and it's one of the byproducts of our uh, civilization nowadays because we release a lot of basically uh, chlorine based elements in the atmosphere and those that will go in the upper atmosphere and break down the ozone layer. So this is something that is really not a good one because typically the gap is huge so this process does not happen naturally by itself, but in the presence, uh, presence of chlorine, this is actually something that can happen easily and it leads to uh, the depletion of the ozone layer. Here is another example of, of a, of a uh, catalyst. You have oxygen reacting with basically oxygen molecule reacting with two molecules of uh, nitrogen uh, monoxide giving you two uh, basically uh, moles, if you want to count moles, two molecules of uh, nitrogen dioxide. The two uh, basically of this uh, nitrogen, they will break naturally into basically two, again, nitrogen monoxides plus two oxygen uh, atoms by themselves. Now the two oxygen atoms, they will react with the two molecules of oxygen and form two new molecules of O3. So this is actually a good thing in the sense that nitrogen monoxide now is actually the catalyst in here because it's required from the beginning. And at the end, it's actually released in full, its full integrity. So as far as it's concerned, what it did is make this chemical reaction starting with oxygen O2 ending up with an oxygen O3. So if you look at it from the big picture, so what's going on in here, I started with an O2, yes, I needed a uh, nitrogen uh, monoxide, but at the end, I released the exact same number of nitrogen monoxide. So 
if I started with 10 grams of uh, nitrogen monoxide, I still have 10 grams at the end of the day. I didn't really change that number a lot. But all the nitrogen monoxide did actually was able to break down this oxygen molecule into its own, basically, oxygen atoms which when combined with another two molecules of oxygen uh, gas, they will basically uh, form uh, two molecules of uh, ozone, basically in this case, O3. So you see, this is an example of a catalyst. Obviously the catalyst in this case is the nitrogen monoxide, not the nitrogen dioxide, because the nitrogen dioxide is produced. So it was not available to begin with. So it was made, yes, it went back, I mean, it, uh, it was eliminated, but that's a product. So the telltale of a catalyst is that it's needed to begin with, but it doesn't enter as one of really the final products of the chemical reaction. In other words, you can scratch it out. You can remove it, okay? But this one you can't remove because it was not there to begin with. So in the beginning, there was no nitrogen dioxide. So the, the answer to the question is, Carefully examine the following chemical sequence of the formation of O3 for molecular oxygen. O2, which, chemi which chemical is behaving as a catalyst? And the answer is NO. It makes sense to you guys? OK, very good. Again. I mentioned the fact that also in the introduction that chemical reactions can produce energy. This type of uh, uh, chemical reaction is called an exothermic uh, reaction. Exo means giving, basically outside, releasing energy. And uh, on the opposite side of that is some chemical reactions actually will need energy for them to, uh, to, uh, to react, for them to, uh, to happen, okay? And this are actually endothermic reactions. Some energy, some reactions that actually require energy to start, they will not happen without energy to begin with, but at the end, they will produce far more energy. So those, the net effect of those is that they're actually exothermic uh, uh, reactions, chemical reactions. But some others, so on the other side of the, uh, of, of the aisle, basically on the other side of the, uh, on the opposite side, they will require a lot of energy, but they still give off energy, okay? So in this case, they still are endothermic reactions. So this is, by the way, the term endothermic reaction, whether uh, an exothermic reaction is also used for nuclear reactions too, although it's really chemical uh, process in here. Well, in order to basically make this happen, in order for a chemical reaction to happen to begin with, you really have to consider, because again, what we said in the chemical reaction is actually a rearrangement of the different uh, constituents, basically, of the different molecules. So if you're going to rearrange things, you really need to pay for that. You need to actually bring some energy at the end of the day whether uh, at the end of the day, the chemical reaction will lower its overall energy by releasing some, or you need to add to it some energy for it to break down the bonding. And the bonding between a hydrogen and a hydrogen bond is this many joules, okay? That's actually kilojoules per mole. Remember, a mole is a huge number. For this case, it's two grams of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen, actually an actual two grams, okay? Of, of hydrogen uh, molecule. So you need 436,000 joules. 436,000 joules may sound a lot, but it's not really a lot when it comes to a chemical reaction in here, okay? Uh, this actually has almost the same bonding, same energy. Hydrogen is the same energy. Roughly, whenever you see hydrogen, it's roughly the same number, around 400, maybe slightly more for the case in here, around 500 and something of energy, kilojoules, okay? Carbon monoxide or carbon, no, this is not necessarily, as long as you see CO by itself, this is how much energy if you want to break that bond, okay? 351 joules, carbon, carbon, 347 so, something joules. So all of this are some of the energies anywhere between 300 and 500 uh, kilojoules, that is, okay? Nitrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen is a cheap operation. They don't require a lot of energy, slightly over 100 kilojoules per mole. Now, chlorine, chlorine, 
that requires a lot of energy for it to break. Okay, carbon uh, monoxide CO two. I mean CO, but you have I'm sorry, still uh, carbon carbon. This is actually a what you have in this case, they are sharing two electrons. Obviously, these are sharing only one electron between them. These are sharing two electrons. There is more energy in this case. Nitrogen, oxygen in this case, NO. Again, uh, it's uh, 600. Uh, so the more in this case, basically electrons are shared, the more the energy is. Okay. But that's basically something to keep in mind. You don't really need to memorize any of these numbers, but just to have an idea in here, that's usually with a single electron shared, the energies are a lot less than when you have two electrons shared or even more, okay? So here is a, an energy balance in here. I have HH, if I go back into the table in here, HH is 436 kilojoules in here, sitting in there, okay? I have chlorine, chlorine, if I go back into this table, it's telling me chlorine, chlorine is 243. So if I add 436 to 243, so in this case, oops, in this case, what is it? Six plus three, that's nine. Three plus four, that's seven. So it's 679 kilojoules to begin with. At the end of the day, I have an HCl, but two of them, two HCLs, 431 and 431. So that is actually uh, 800, So let me do the math in here. Yeah, it's 862 kilojoules. The difference between them is the energy that is going to be released for this chemical reaction in here. I think this is wrong. I have to check on this one, honestly. Okay. I think this is an endothermal chemical reaction. I think it's not correct in here. Okay, here is the challenge. Check if this is a So we're going to have that and make sure that we answer this, this question here correctly, okay? Okay, here's the map actually. Did I put the wrong number? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think it's correct. Okay. I think it's correct. Somebody made a, yeah, I think I, yes. Okay. Go through the mass again, Corin and everybody else, and make sure you add up the numbers and to decide how much the actual difference is. Okay. Okay. So uh, again, it is the natural tendency. So again, the entropy it is the natural tendency to disperse from where it is concentrated to where it is dilute. This is another way of expressing the entropy. And I know we mentioned it when we were doing uh, thermodynamics. So again, it is the natural tendency of energy to, uh, so examples, a hot pan radiates heat. So 
So basically, if you take a cup of water, I mean, a hot cup of water, and you put it outside, it's going to basically disperse heat by basically going into a cooler and cooler and interacting with its environment. That is, in a nutshell, what the second law of thermodynamics says. And this is, in this case, gasoline combusts into smaller molecules because then it disperses. So that is the natural tendency. So that's why gasoline, marbles bouncing on the floor come to a stop again. They release that energy each time they bounce off of the floor through uh, dissipation of uh, energy. So entropy in this sense is the term used to describe the degree with which energy has been basically dispersed throughout the smaller components. So the reactions that result in an increase in entropy energy dispersal tend to occur on their own. They don't need catalyst, they don't need temperature, they don't need anything, okay? Because of that, they release energy on their own, okay? However, endothermic chemical reactions really require something. So because the entropy would prohibit such a chemical reaction to happen on its own. So in order for you to help it happen, in this case, you need either a catalyst or a temperature or energy of some sort to cause it to happen. So that is why endothermic chemical reactions require that. And the photosynthesis is one of them, actually, because photosynthesis will go into reorgan or reorganizing matter in a fashion that actually increases entropy. So for you to happen, that it decreases the entropy, I'm sorry, you will have more organization. So in that case, for you to have it to happen, you require energy, and the sun is one uh, source of that energy. So this is in a nutshell your chapter. I think we probably could have done, look, this is what I'm gonna do then next time when we meet, I'm going to come, because I noticed, as I said before, that we are at least one half week behind, okay? When I went through the lectures. So instead of uh, basically doing a short, basically because this is the entire lecture for this chapter, instead of doing it this way, so what I'm suggesting probably next time is probably combine two chapters together and make sure that we cover all the topics in there. If you think that's too much, then please let me know so that we can, uh, because we really are, we need to uh, recover at least half a, half a week basically before the end of the semester. Otherwise we're going to have an issue by basically missing on some of the great stuff to at the end, namely astronomy, okay? So if you guys don't have any questions, I'm going to stop the recording. And I will see you Tuesday of next week. So was the item for discussion to verify and check the energy for that equation that we talked about? Yes, okay. that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'll see you.